We're halfway through the week. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Idi Yunin Saur. Coming up on today's edition of Business Daily. A U.S. trade body recommends big tariffs on Samsung and LG to keep them from flooding the American market with low-cost washing machines. Recently, Korea's Hyundai Motor has been chosen as the chair company of the Hydrogen Council, and we take a look at what efforts are being made to promote the wider use of hydrogen energy. These stories and more coming right up. Let's start with our coverage of the markets. And for that, we have our markets contributor, Jemmy Kim, joining us on the line. Hello, Jemmy. Hello. All right, so can you tell us how the markets fared here on this Wednesday? Yeah, sure. Korean shares started on an uptick bolstered by institutional buying. Overnight rallies on Wall Street also helped boost investor sentiment. But action became a bit muted in midday trading as the main cost of the index closed nearly flat, rising just 0.39% to finish at 2450.51 points. The tech-heavy cost stock, which has been at the center of attention recently for regaining its upward momentum over the past couple of weeks, hit a record high but finished lower at 780.90 point, uh, points, falling 1.07% from yesterday. Uh, for the past week, trade volume on the cost stock has been exceeding that of the cost and today volume has reached over 10 trillion won, according to the Boris operator. All right. Can you break down some of the market action for us? Certainly. Uh, right now, uh, on the main boards, the tech and financial and machinery stocks were, on, were all the winners today. And the tech industry also fared quite well. Uh, number one market cap, Samsung Electronics, rose more than more than uh, 1%. Uh, and it's uh, expected to hit 300 million on one line pretty soon. Uh, it actually rose 1.23%. LG Electronics rose uh, 3.3%. 23%, while SK Hynix shot up 2.12%. Now, Samsung and LG share prices uh, were little affected by the ICT recommendation for higher tariffs uh, for the higher, larger number of washers they manufacture outside of the U.S. President Trump is poised to ratify the recommendation next year, and until then, these Korean firms, along with the government, will continue to petition for a reduction. Uh, in the financial sector, Samsung Life jumped 1.52% as well. Uh, however, among the other market uh, heavyweights, such as Hyundai Motor, Hyundai Motor fell 1.27%. And on the cost stock, Celtrion, whose market cap now stands at fifth largest, also fell. So what are some of the events lined up for the rest of the week? Right. Well, tomorrow the EU will be announcing its preliminary purchasing managers index and manufacturing figures for November, uh, provided by a global information firm IHS Market. And these figures will help determine business conditions as they had been weak in October for the EU. Uh, and also, on, uh, so some of the market watchers are now waiting to see how the date data fares for this month. And on Friday, the European Central Bank's vice president will be giving a speech on rate policies in the region. And also on this day, the U.S. will be announcing uh, its preliminary service and manufacturing figures, also from IHS market from November. And just to mention, South Trion actually fell 3.19%. And that's it for me, uh, Jenny Kim, for Business Daily. The U.S. International Trade Commission has recommended a tariff rate quota on imported Korean washing machines made by Samsung and LG. Now, this comes after American home appliance giant Whirlpool filed a petition back in May against the two Korean manufacturers. Our Kim hyo Sun tells us more. The U.S. International Trade Commission has called for a 50 percent tariff rate on Korean washing machines, exceeding a quota of 1.2 million units. The global safeguard measure was suggested on Tuesday following the recommendation set forth by American appliance giant Whirlpool, which brought the initial complaint against its Korean rivals, Samsung and LG, earlier this year. And the panel was split on whether to impose a 20 percent tariff on washers imported fewer than 1.2 million units. The recommendation will be reported to President Trump soon, who is expected to make his final decision by early next year. If ratified, it will be the second time for Washington to impose global safeguard limits. Former President George W. Bush imposed temporary tariffs of up to 30 percent on steel imported from countries including South Korea in 2002. Samsung and LG Electronics account for 16 and 13 percent of the U.S. large residential washers market, respectively, 
and exported washing machines worth some $1 billion to the United States last year. Kim hyo san Business Daily. Korea's agriculture sector could be heavily affected by possible amendments of the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. An expert from the Korea Rural Economic Institute said Wednesday the country's agricultural trade deficit has worsened since DFDA took effect to stand at around 750 million U.S. dollars. He said the prices of local agricultural products have dropped and domestic producers are unable to compete with surging imports from the U.S. In particular, U.S. beef imports dominated the domestic market in September, accounting for nearly 48 percent of all Korean beef imports. The United States has imposed additional sanctions on North Korea, as well as Chinese firms with suspected business ties with the regime. This comes after U.S. President Donald Trump hinted at more sanctions on Monday while naming North Korea a state sponsor of terror. Our Yoo Jun Hee reports. The U.S. Treasury Department says it's blacklisting one Chinese national, 13 entities, and 20 shipping vessels for helping Pyongyang bypass UN sanctions. In a statement on Tuesday, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said the new measures were in line with Washington's efforts to maximize economic pressure and isolate the regime from external sources of trade and revenue. The sanctions will target transportation networks as well as individuals and trading firms with business ties to North Korea to cut off funding for its nuclear and missile developments. The U.S. has already introduced a slew of new punitive measures against Pyongyang this year, which also target Chinese and Russian entities. According to the Treasury Department, three Chinese trading companies exported roughly $650 million U.S. million in goods to North Korea while importing $100 million worth over a recent four-and-a-half-year period. These included vital commodities like coal and iron, as well as vehicles, machinery, and other items associated with North Korea's construction of nuclear reactors. The latest move comes just one day after President Trump announced the U.S. was reinstating North Korea on its list of state sponsors of terrorism. The regime is now one of four countries in the world to be designated as such, joining the ranks of Iran, Sudan, and Syria. The reclusive nation had been removed from that list in 2008 under the previous George W. Bush administration as part of a nuclear deal which ultimately collapsed. Eugenie, Business Daily. Air China, China's state-owned passenger carrier, has suspended its flights between Beijing and Pyongyang, with the move expected to deepen North Korea's growing isolation. Our Park ji has more. Air China has pulled the plug on flights between Beijing and Pyongyang, citing unsatisfactory business operations. The decision came after the U.S. government put North Korea back on its list of state sponsors of terrorism. AP reports quoting airline officials that Air China's flight to and from Pyongyang on Monday was its last flight to the north, and they have no idea when or if the flights will resume. A Chinese TV channel also reports that Air China has withdrawn its personnel from its offices in Pyongyang. Air China opened a route between Beijing and Pyongyang in 2008, but the flights were often chronically underbooked, so cancellations were a frequent occurrence. With the move, North Korea's Air Korea becomes the only airline that regularly connects the two countries. The North Korean airline has regular flights to four cities in China, including Beijing and Vladivostok in Russia. Train and other land routes between China and North Korea will stay intact. Park ji Business Daily. With the Bank of Korea expected to raise interest rates soon, fears are being rekindled over the nation's household debt burden. The country's outstanding household debt has surpassed 1.4 quadrillion won, or nearly 1.3 trillion U.S. dollars, at the end of the third quarter. According to the Bank of Korea, total debt rose $28 billion during the July to September period, an average rise of $9 billion for each month. This is the highest total figure since relevant data started being collected in 2002. Despite the government's latest housing regulations, mortgage loans continue to increase, as well as credit loans. 
So there's anticipation that the Bank of Korea could soon be ready to raise its key interest rate as early as next week. The possibility has prompted banks to hike their borrowing costs. In fact, they're enjoying some of their biggest profit in years amid the widening spread between loan and deposit rates. Our Eunice Kim has the story. An upward revision of Korea's projected growth rate by the IMF. A seoul Ottawa currency swap, a hushed North Korea, and thawing relations with China. Against the backdrop of these encouraging factors, six out of nine global investment banks view a rate increase of a quarter percent as likely when the Bank of Korea holds its monthly policy meeting next Thursday. Should it come to fruition, it would be the first movement of the key rate in 16 months. Financial institutions already on the move. The COFIX, short for Cost of Funding Index, serves as a benchmark for mortgages. It was set at 1.62 percent last month, up one-tenth of a percentage point from September. That represents the highest jump since November of last year. Following the announcement of the new COFIX rate, mortgage rates offered by commercial banks climbed as high as 4.5 percent. This as interest on savings falls even deeper from the already low level. The average rate in September was 1.12 percent, a figure that had ticked down 0.01 percentage point from the month before. And as the spread between the deposit and loan rates widens, banks are bringing in their best income to date. Data from the country's financial watchdog shows domestic banks posted a combined $10.2 billion equivalent in net profit over the first nine months of this year. That's double what was last year and the highest in six years. Interest income through the third quarter amounted to an equivalent of $25 billion, again a peak since 2012. While financial regulators are mulling over ways to curb the gains made by banks, it remains to be seen whether they'll achieve the intended effect. Eunice Kim, Business Daily. The average monthly income of Korean workers was tallied at $2,577 last year. According to Statistics Korea, workers with an average monthly income of roughly between $1,373 and $2,300 took up around a quarter of the total labor force. Those under the age of 29 earned an average of $1,667 per month, less than that of workers over the age of 60. Employees at large companies earned over twice as much compared to people working at small and mid-sized firms. The gender pay gap was also significant as male workers earned about 1.6 times more than their female counterparts. The Korean government plans to create 10 innovative cities across the country to foster a more balanced development. Prime Minister Lee nak said the city clusters will be the cornerstones of inclusive economic growth aimed at generating more jobs and opportunities. He said by giving more power to local governments, decentralization can stimulate new developments in regional areas outside of large cities. The government will report to President Moon Jae-in early next year on details of the plan for achieving balanced development. The nationwide restriction on poultry movement has been lifted, but a new, more focused ban has been issued. All poultry transportation in Kuchang County of Cholabukto province has been suspended for the next five days following an outbreak of bird flu in the area. The Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs announced the measures, which will last until midnight on November 26th. A 10-kilometer wide quarantine zone has also been designated in Suncheon, Jeollanamdo province. Poultry movement there will be banned for a much longer three-week period, while inspections are carried out on all duck farms in the region. It's been one week since a strong earthquake hit Korea's southeastern city of Pohang, and the area is still being rocked by smaller aftershocks. So to help those in need, the government has designated the city as a special disaster zone. Here's our Oh Jung-hee with more. 
Three relatively weak aftershocks struck the earthquake-hit city of Pohang on Tuesday morning. The first was a magnitude 2.0 tremor at around 6 o'clock, followed by a magnitude 2.1 quake just before 9. And a third aftershock of magnitude 2.4 hit the city just before 10. These were the first aftershocks in 24 hours after strong tremors of magnitude 3.5 and 3.6 hit the area late Sunday night and early Monday. The total number of aftershocks since last Wednesday's earthquake stands at over 60. Promising all-out efforts to contain and prevent further damage from the series of tremors, the government designated Pohang as a special disaster zone on Monday. The move is aimed at lessening the regional government's administrative and financial burden during the recovery process. Roughly 65 percent of the budget required for restoration projects in Pohang will be covered by the government. For local taxpayers who've been affected by the quake, the country's tax service is providing deadline extensions and halting tax investigations. Tax will also be deducted for businesses that have seen over 20 percent of their property damaged. Fees for health insurance, gas and electricity will be reduced, and some citizens could start their military service a little later or be exempt from mobilization training. Oh Jung-hee, Business Daily. And more damage is still being reported from the earthquake in Pohang. Now, unsurprisingly, the tremors caused a lot of physical damage, but owners have been left stunned after discovering they're not covered by most insurance policies. Our Elliot Kim has more. This car was destroyed by falling debris from the earthquake. But even though the damage was incurred by a natural disaster, it isn't covered by most insurance plans. Auto insurance policies cover damage from floods and typhoons, but earthquakes aren't handled in the same way. In order to receive compensation, a separate earthquake insurance policy needs to be owned, on top of comprehensive property coverage. The problem is, few people have signed up to them since earthquakes are so infrequent in Korea. The 3.2% coverage rate is just one-tenth of Japan, where earthquakes occur more often. The affected Gyeongbuk area has a higher coverage rate than most regions, but even those are abysmal when considering insurance rates can be as low as just above half a percent of property values. Foreign earthquake insurance products often compensate for indirect damage rather than direct damage. In Korea, people seem to only own insurance products like flood damage policies because they cover direct damage. Of course, in the case of personal injury or death, compensation can be received through life insurance or accident insurance policies, even if they are caused by an earthquake. Elliot Kim, Business Daily. With growing concerns over the environment and climate change, countries around the world are looking for cleaner and greener sources of energy. Amid the search, hydrogen has emerged as one of the most promising sources of alternative energy. To tell us more about these green energy options and what Korea is doing to promote them, our Lee ji joins us in the studio today. Good to see you. Hi, ji All right, so how does this hydrogen energy work and what makes it so attractive? Well, ji hydrogen is one of the cleanest power sources currently known to us, and the element can be converted into energy using fuel cell technology. As you can see in the graphics, when hydrogen is put into fuel cell, it creates chemical reaction by mixing with oxygen in the air. This reaction creates electrical energy and heat with water as its only byproduct. And the energy is not only harmless to the environment, but is virtually unlimited because hydrogen can be harnessed from water, one of the most abundant resources we have. Well, it sure sounds like a very promising future energy. So how far have we come from a technological point of view? I mean, is it ready for it to be used worldwide? Uh, the U.S., European nations, and Japan have been actively investing in the industry. But the world at large is still in the developing stages of hydrogen production, storage, and usage. As of now, one of the most developed and familiar usage of the energy is hydrogen vehicles. Let's take a closer look. Korea's Hyundai Motor was the first to launch a hydrogen fuel cell car back in 2013. And since then, the market has become more competitive. Japan's Toyota and Honda followed suit soon after, and as of last year, close to 2,500 hydrogen fuel cell vehicles were sold or leased. Though the figure is small, it is a three-fold increase compared to 2015, and the market is expected to grow exponentially. 
Some 22.2 million vehicles are estimated to be out on the roads by 2032, according to research and market. These sales are projected to generate collective revenues of over 1.1 trillion U.S. dollars for the auto industry by 2032. And some of these pioneers are even going a step further, using their fuel cell vehicles to power their homes. In Yeoido's Hangang Park is a home showcase where everything from a TV, air conditioner, and even a food blender is powered by hydrogen energy. Just outside the house are three hydrogen fuel cell cars that are powering the electricity inside just by having its engine on. Each car produces around 10 kilowatts of electricity per hour, which is enough for a family of four to use for nine days. And even the distilled tap water is also produced by the vehicles. With a vast amount of hydrogen in its storage tank, the car serves as a moving power generator. This hydrogen fuel cell car is not only your means of transportation, but it can also work as a backup power unit when campings and during blackouts in the near future. So now that hydrogen is being more used commonly around us, so what about questions over its safety? I mean, we are aware that this gas is extremely flammable. Yes, hydrogen is flammable, but so is petroleum and other, many other gases we use today. And because hydrogen is lighter than air, experts say it instantaneously dissipates into the atmosphere, making it no more likely to catch fire than gasoline is. Moreover, the high-pressure hydrogen tanks make the gas even safer. The hydrogen tanks are made with highly durable carbon fiber that has gone through extreme ballistic testing, such as crash tests and even firing bullets at it. Because the safety standards for hydrogen are so high, it can be used in a safer manner than other gases. All right, so it sure sounds like a great idea for the world to rely more on this energy. Now, what is the Korean government doing in order to widen its use? Well, firstly, in order to uh, boost the number of hydrogen vehicles on the roads, the Environment Ministry is currently providing subsidies of 27.5 million Korean won, or roughly $25,000 per vehicle, on top of other aid from local governments. Now, the Moon administration aims to increase the number of hydrogen fuel cell cars in the country to 15,000 by 2022, and the number of hydrogen charging stations to more than 300 nationwide. However, experts say a more comprehensive measure is needed. Japan has a roadmap toward the realization of a hydrogen society for the next 10 to even 50 years, investing in various needed infrastructure. And these investments in infrastructure require huge sums of money, which individual firms cannot finance alone. So the government has to step up and provide an overall long-term plan in supporting businesses and research on new energy sources. So, as of now, what are some of the challenges standing in the way in achieving this goal? Well, even until today, uh, around 95% of the world's hydrogen is produced from chemically reforming fossil fuels, such as natural gas and oil, by using high-temperature steam. Now, although hydrogen energy, in theory, does not produce greenhouse gases, this reforming process leads to the production of carbon dioxide. So a better way of producing hydrogen is through electrolysis, a process of splitting water to make hydrogen and oxygen. But experts say this process process still needs to be developed further. A lot of energy is needed to split water. In fact, more electricity is used in the process than the amount of energy that could be produced from the hydrogen created. So some countries use renewable energy such as solar and wind power in splitting water to save cost. But it's not easy for countries like Korea, where we don't have vast amounts of those renewable energies. All right, let's hope that Korea continues to work toward overcoming this challenge and see a wider use of hydrogen energy in the country. Thank you so much for coming in today. My pleasure. And that wraps it up for today. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with more at the same time, same place for your business daily. Until then, goodbye.